Shalom. Welcome to Thursday Bible Study. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Exodus 35 through 40 and finishing up Exodus. And uh, so let's just get started in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you today and we ask you, Lord, to just bless this time. We know that you're here with us and that we just ask you to guide us, point out your wisdom, Lord, and, and share that with us, Lord, and uh, let us grow in your knowledge. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Okay, the scripture for today is James 1, 5. So we're headed for the New Testament for change. And James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. What a wonderful thing to know that God doesn't condemn us when we ask for wisdom, and he'll give us that liberally. The Jewish understanding of wisdom uh, in this uh, context is that it uh, contains God's pure and peace-giving truths, and those things are revealed in his word. And only such godly wi wisdom brings joy and patience in the submission to him. So if we submit to him, he will give us that wisdom. And it's the only wisdom that comes from God his wisdom that really is valuable. Uh, we can get a lot of vis wisdom in the world, but uh, that doesn't gain us anything. Uh, we need God's wisdom. So the Book of Mysteries today is day 236. And this is the Blueprints of the Spirit. The teacher took me into the Chamber of Vessels and to its only bookcase. Inside its shelves were large bound volumes of plans, instructions, and diagrams. He removed one of them from the top shelf, laid it on the wooden table, and opened it up. It looks like a mechanical drawing, I said. It's a blueprint of sorts, he said. These are the plans based on the instructions given by God for the building of the tabernacle. Note the precision. precision. Everything had to be made exactly according to the pattern to the exact measurements and specifications, and it all came about through a man named Bazalel. And God had filled him with his spirit, and through Bazalel, the spirit of God built the temple. And what does that reveal? Well, the spirit, I said, fulfills the plans of God. Exactly. And the building of the tabernacle was part of the law of Moses. And the day that marks the giving of the law is the Feast of Shavuot. And on the same day of the Feast of Shavuot, which we call Pentecost, the Spirit of God was given to the first followers of Messiah. The same Spirit translated all these plans and blueprints and measurements into reality. That same Spirit was given to his people, given to you. Why? To do the same work, to translate the purposes of God into reality. As it is written, I will put my Spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes. Behind the word statutes is a Hebrew word that speaks of an appointed times and measures. You see, God's purposes, God's will, and plans for your life are just as detailed, specific, and precise as the plans and measurements of the tabernacle. His plans are perfect, and not only for your life, but for every day of your life, for every moment. That's why he gives you the Spirit. The Spirit gives you the power to fulfill God's plan to move in his perfect will, and to walk in the exact steps down to the exact measurements and specifications of his appointed purposes of your life. Make it your aim to find and fulfill the perfect and precise plan God has for your life. Live by the Spirit. Move in his leading, and you will walk into your appointed footsteps, footsteps as real and as, as exact as the diagrams in this book. They're already there in the blueprints of your spirit. The mission today is to seek to live this day in the heavenly pattern, walk, speak, and move by the, the impulse and leading of the Spirit into the divine blueprint. So think every day is part of God's blueprint for my life. If you think about that, and you know that God is leading you, you know, you'll have that purpose in life, and you'll have the confidence that you're doing God's will. Now, our Hebrew word study today, I've put up uh, several words on the board, and um, 
we're going to be uh, running across these in Exodus. Uh, the first one is Benai Yisrael, which is the children of Israel. And of course, that's what God calls the Hebrews uh, throughout Exodus, calls them the children of Israel, his children. Uh, Benai is children, and Yisrael, of course, uh, represents um, the, the country of Israel, the nation. Uh, but it means wrestled with God. And of course, that comes from Jacob when he wrestled with God and God changed his name to Israel. Uh, then there's Benior. And we are Benior. We are the children of light. That's what God calls us, the children of light. Remember, O-R is, is light in Hebrew, Benior. Now, the uh, final word on the board is teshuva. And teshuva is to repent. But... When you look at the Hebrew word, what does it really mean to repent? I think uh, in our um, culture, we don't really understand the word repent. We think it's to say you're sorry, and that's part of it, but it's not complete. To repent is to turn and go back to God. That's what you want to do. So when you <laughs> repent, when you say you're sorry, then you want to change your life and go back and do what God wants you to do and to follow God. If you just say, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't really mean anything, does it? It's a head thing. It's not a heart thing. And so it's like uh, so many words in Hebrew, they have an extra meaning. They have a deeper meaning. It's like to hear. Uh, that always fascinated me until I learned the Hebrew word. Uh, and it's to hear and to obey. Uh, when when they, the word you, write, you see the word in the Old Testament, and, and even in the New Testament, you know, uh, it's when God is saying, you know, hear, he who has an ear, let him hear. It's he who has an ear, let him hear and obey. Mm -hmm. So once you hear the word, then you are to obey. That's part of the whole thing. So uh, it, it's a completion of the thing. You know, you don't just hear and then go about and do your own thing. That's not what God wants. He wants you to turn back to him. And so we're going to talk about that a little more in our lesson when we, uh, when we come to it. Um, we're going to wrap up Exodus today. Uh, we've been studying it off and on for seven months. Um, we actually started in January, and it seems like uh, we've traveled a long time with these people, and um, they're hard-headed. <laughs> they, they had a lot to learn. You know, they were coming out of a um, very deep pagan culture that had influenced them, and... Uh, they didn't have a lot of knowledge at this time about God. They, they, were still, they still knew God, but they didn't really understand anything yet. He was going to take them and form them into his nation to be an example for the whole country, his people. And so he had almost three million people, maybe more, that he was working with. What a, what a crowd of these. <laughs> you know, Some of them had good hearts. Some of them wanted to follow God, and a lot of them just wanted to do their own thing. They just wanted to be out and make their own decisions, you know, and, and do whatever they wanted. And a lot of them were influenced by the Egyptian culture and had pagan, a lot of pagan things going on in their lives too, and he had to get rid of that. And so his job was cut out for him. And of course, Moses' job was certainly cut out for him, but he was the man for the time. And I believe that God chooses men down through the years for his purposes that will stand out above. You know, when we think about Abraham Lincoln and how he stood out above the crowd, you know, he was certainly not a perfect man, but he was a good man and um, read his Bible and understood, uh, you know, scripture and uh, God used him mightily uh, to bring our country back together at that time. So uh, <clears throat> I have perfect faith in the Lord that he finds men who will serve him at, at the time needed. So um, we're looking at one right now. We're looking at Moses here and, and how he was used by God. Um, we're going to open now to chapter 35. We're going to really travel through these last uh, six chapters quickly. A lot of it is repetition, and, and there's nothing wrong with repetition, but we're not going to... Uh, really go through everything precisely anymore because I think you've already got in your mind uh, the uh, things that were to be made with the tabernacle and this is going to cover the actual making of it and putting it together and we'll really focus on chapter 40 and end it later but uh, as we go through the chapters there'll be things that I need to point out. <clears throat> now we're at the point now where Moses ha has dealt with the golden calf 
taken care of that. God has dealt with the people that were involved in that, and uh, they were destroyed for their um, pagan things that they did. And um, he's gone back up on the mountain again because he needs to replace those, tab those um, tablets. And uh, so he's up there again for another 40 days, and it says 40 days without food and water. That's a long time without any food and water, but God miraculously um, took him through all that, and uh, it was time for him to go down this time, and, and he had blueprints under one arm and, and his tablets on another arm, and uh, then we find him down now, and he's um, gathered all the, uh, the B'nai, Israel, all the children of Israel together, and he's going to tell them what the Lord's commanded. So now they're getting their marching orders as to what to do with the tabernacle. They've been waiting a long time to, to find out what he found out, you know, up on the mountain, and now they're going to know. Now, the one thing I want to uh, go back to chapter 34, and uh, it says, The children of Israel saw the face of Moses when he came down from the mountain, and the skin on his face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to, sp uh, to speak with him. So whenever, God, whenever Moses went in to speak to God, in the, they had a temple of meeting that was previous to the temple. Remember, the tabernacle hadn't been built yet. That was going to be built right away. But they had a little tent there that, that Moses would go in, and, and that was called the tabernacle of meeting. That was the first one, really. It was just a little one. And so when he would go in there and, and speak to God in there, um, his face would shine, and then he would come out. And I always thought that they were afraid of him because he was shining. Well, I think I misunderstood that, and uh, I, I've come to believe that they were really afraid to see that light fade. As, his, as he was out from God, his face would fade away, the light would fade away. And so they were afraid that God was disappearing. And so the veil was to keep them from fear of that. So that's, that's a new understanding for me, which makes a lot of sense uh, to me anyway. Um, so uh, he's now meeting with them. And of course, you know, after he comes out speaking with God, why he's got the veil on in front of people. <coughs> so uh, I'll continue here and... Um, Let's see, yeah, let me check here. Um, uh, I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, he gathered them around and said to them, these are the words of the Lord has commanded that you should do them. Six days work to be done and the seventh day shall be to you as a holy day, a Sabbath to rest of rest to the Lord. Whoever does work therein shall be put to death. Very, you know, God was very strict, especially when he's beginning something new like this. Um, he has very strict um, uh, discipline to keep everything pure. He doesn't want any nonsense, any, anything to come in there that will destroy his plan to start with. You know, he wants that all set up. There's going to be plenty of stuff going on in, in the future, you know, that seems to be allowed. But when it's beginning, he wants that everyone to know exactly what he wanted. So it's clear for them. So, very serious. Um, not to do any work on Sabbath. Uh, you shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from you among an offering to the Lord, whosoever is a willing heart. Let him bring it, an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and brass blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and kitchen wood, and oil for the light, and spices for anointing oil, for the sweet incense, and onyx stones, and stones to be set in the aphod, and for the breastplate, and every wise-hearted among you shall come, and make all that the Lord has commanded. Um, and it continues on of the things that are going to be needed. I, I just want to emphasize um, that... Um, chapter, uh, verse 5 where it says um, whoever has a willing heart God doesn't want your stuff if you're not willing to give it mm -hmm. um, there are certain sin offerings that he has, has commanded them you know they need to do but the other offerings um, is to be given willingly 
Uh, it, it's no different than you and, a, and your child or someone in your family. If they give you something begrudgingly, uh, I, I think of um, something I heard once from um, Pastor Chuck Smith. He said um, he went to dinner at someone's house and they offered him uh, a second glass of milk. He said, I always love milk, so I drank the milk. And, and then the fella said, well, I guess we're not gonna have any milk for our babies th this week. And he said, <laughs> Why in the world did he offer it to me? You know, he said, I don't want it in that matter. He said, I went to the store and I bought, a, bought milk for the baby. So, um, you know, but that's the attitude. Nobody wants that. God certainly doesn't want that. He, he doesn't need anything. He's, he's wanting it because he's, we are his children and he loves us and it pleases him that we uh, want to do that for him. So uh, the Bible actually says, uh, a cheerful giver, is, the word in Hebrew is hilarious. He loves a hilarious giver. <laughs> Here it is, oh, I just love giving to the Lord. Okay, that's what he wants. And so um, uh, this is very important uh, that uh, we remember that. Um, and it calls for, uh, in the Hebrew, it, where it says to give an offering, it's a heave offering. We've talked about a heave offering, it's where you put it on your shoulder, you know, and carry it in. That's why they call it a heave offering. But a heave offering was always um, a freely given offering. And um, it was called teshuva. And here's our word on here, to repent and to turn back to God. That's what he wants. He wants us to turn back to him. It's no different here than, in, in, than it is with us. He wants everyone to turn back to him. Um, so um, I'm going to... Uh, skip over to, to 36 because the rest of this is just um, uh, talking about um, all of the things that um, they were to do. Um, and everyone was happy to do it. It was very interesting to see that. Now in chapter uh, 36, it, um, it affirms that uh, Basilel and Holiab were going to be the uh, two people that were going to be in charge. And uh, they were really responsible for the the major work, you know, but there many, many people were working on it too. That you know, it took a lot of people to do it. And um, in uh, let's see, I think it's thirty-six seven. It says, <clears throat> "For the stuff they had was sufficient for all work to make, and too much." So um, <clears throat> people brought so much, they they were overwhelmed by it all, and. Uh, Moses had to say, stop, stop, you know, <laughs> don't bring any more. We've got too much now. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I, I'm waiting for Pastor Tom to make an announcement at church, you know, stop giving. You've given too much. <laughs> <laughs> so they were wanting to do it, and we need to want to do it too. So, okay. Um, the rest of the chapter just simply... Uh, goes on about uh, the tabernacle and uh, repeating the instructions for all of the things. They're busy working on all of it. And um, then let's go to um, chapter 38. <coughs> and uh, still working on the, um, on finishing up all the, the, some of the furniture and everything in it. So um, we'll just read one through 20 here. <coughs> Uh, he made an altar of burnt offering of shittim wood. Five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth uh, thereof. And it was four square, and it was, uh, it was square. And three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns of it on the four corners of it, and the horns were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the flesh hooks, and the fire pans, and the vessels thereof he made of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network under the comp compass, therefore beneath the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass to be placed for the staves. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put staves into the rings on the side of the altar and bare it withal. And he made the altar hollow with boards. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass and the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled all at the door of the tabernacle. So um, all of that brass came from the women that were, and it's in Hebrew it says an army of women there. Everybody wanted to contribute. And they were the uh, 
hand mirrors that had been the Egyptian women that, that they'd given them when they left. So everybody had a hand mirror, and so they all, um, it was just so brushed so fine they could kind of see their reflection. It, it, I don't think it was nearly like we think of as a mirror, but it was something, you know, they could see a little bit. So uh, they were happy to give their hand mirrors, you know, to the Lord. And um, it says, he made the court, and on the south side, the uh, hangings of the court were fine linen, 100 cubits, and pillars were 20, their brazen sockets 20, the pillars, uh, hooks, and their fillets were made of silver. The north side of the hangings were 100 cubits, their pillars were 20, and their sockets brass 20, and the hooks of the pillars and their fillet, fillets, or fillets, I, maybe it was fillets of silver. And uh, for the west side were hangings of 50 cubits, and their hangings, uh, their pillars 10, their sockets 10, the hooks of the pillars, and their fillets uh, of silver. And on the east side, 50 cubits. And hangings on one side of the gate were 15, their pillars 3, and their sockets 3. The other side, the court gate on his hand, and that hand were hangings of 15 cubits, and their pillars 3, and sockets 3. All the hangings of the court round were fine twined linen, and the sockets of the pillars were of brass, the hooks and pill pillars and their fillets of silver, and the overlying of their uh, chapiters of silver, and all the pillars of the court were uh, filleted with silver. And the hanging of the gate of the court was needlework, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twined linen, and if your Bible says they were embroidered by women, it w they were woven by women. That's a miss... Uh, uh, misunderstanding there uh, when the Bible was translated. <coughs> they were woven. Uh, all the pins of the tabernacle and the court roundabout were brass, and the sum of the tabernacle even... Oh, I'm going to stop there. That was 20. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, the verses 21 through 31 covers the inventory uh, that was taken by Moses. Now, uh, everything's done now at this point. And so Moses goes in, and he... Uh, looks over everything to make sure it's done just precisely as the Lord has advised, and he found uh, that it was good. Um, he had uh, Aaron's youngest son, which I thought that was kind of interesting, Ithamar, the youngest son. He was one that actually survived <laughs> and did become a, a priest, you know, um, and lived on. And so he went in, and he was helping count all of this. He was counting the, sh the shekels. Remember, they took a census, and uh, Moses took a census, and everybody, every man, 20 and over, had to pay half a shekel, and that was to be used uh, for the silver. That's what they did with it, and they melted it down and, and used it. And so um, that was Ithamar's job, to count the, the silver. So that's covered there. Um, it says uh, about the gold. Let's see, where is that about the gold here? Um, I lost my place, sorry. Um, well, somewhere it says gold. Oh, talks about the silver. 24. 24, 24. Okay, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, um, I f sat down and figured out <laughs> how much. Today's uh, value of gold is uh, $1,760 an ounce Ooh. as of two days ago. <laughs> that's a lot, okay? And then I multiplied that by all of the ounces and all the, gold, all the gold that was used in there came to almost $70 million today in today's value. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of gold, a lot of gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the census itself uh, came to 603, 550 men. So, that's just men. They didn't count the women. They didn't count the kids. So if you conservatively say a family of four for the average, there were probably many, had many more children than that, but just that's <coughs> real conservative, um, it would come to about two and a half million, and you figure probably a lot more than that. So we're looking at the population of between two and three million at least. <coughs> so a lot of, lot of people. Okay, um, 
Let's go on to chapter 39. Uh, 1 through 33 uh, covers um, the head of the years. Um, see, I didn't recognize my note here. Um, I think I got a typo there. Um, 1 through 33 covers the making of the priestly garments in chapter 39. So uh, we've kind of gone over all of that. Um, let's see, verse 32. Um, let's, let's just start right there, verse 32 and of chapter 39. Uh, Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent and the congregation of the congregation was finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. So everything was complete. Moses had blessed everyone for it. Um, they did exactly what the Lord wanted. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all his furniture, and his tashes, and boards, and bars, and pillars, and sockets, and the covering of the rams, uh, skins dyed red, and the covering of the badger skins, and the bale of the covering, and the ark of the testimony, and the staves thereof, and the mercy seat, and the table, and all the vessels, and all the showbread, the pure candlestick, or which was menorah, with the lamps thereof, and with the lamps to be set in order, and all the vessels thereof, and the oil for light, and the golden altar, and the anointed oil, and the sweet incense, and the hanging for the tabernacle door, and the brazen altar, and his grate of, of brass, his staves, and all his vessels, and labor in his foot. The hangings of the court, his pillars, his sockets, and the hanging for the court gate, his cords and his pins, and all the vessels of the service of the tabernacle for the tent of the congregation, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and his son's garments to minister in the priest's office. According to all that the Lord commanded, so uh, Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so, they'd done it, and Moses blessed them. So, you know, that's a lot of stuff they had to do, and they had to do it precisely. And, um, well, you know, it is figured that they probably started, uh, well, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, on this chron chronology that's on the second page of your notes, um, the Exodus actually started uh, with the first year. Now, God gave them a new year, a new um, religious calendar at this time. This is when this was activated. Before the calendar was uh, started in the fall with the Rosh Hashanah, they still celebrate Rosh Hashanah in the fall and they go around, but they, have, they actually have two calendars. They've got, that's their civil calendar, the old calendar starts in the fall. This God gave them a new calendar, new religious calendar with the feasts in it so we can follow the feasts it's a messian I call it a messianic calendar because it really uh, defines everything about Messiah going through it. And so this is the the initiation of it that God is forming a new country, a new nation that's going to be uh serving him supposedly, it's supposed to be. And um he's giving them this guideline with this calendar. And so that's the beginning. That was the first month when they uh crossed the Red Sea and came to it. So um, all of this thing, all this took place from Passover. Remember, Passover was in, in uh, Egypt, and then they, they came out of that, you know, and that was the beginning. So um, the Passover was on the 14th, so they would have been in, in Egypt for two weeks of the new year, and then from then on, they're in the new year, you know, as they travel. So... By the time Moses gets off the mountain the second time, they figure it was the sixth or seventh month into the calendar. So uh, the first month is Abib, or they call it Nisan now, um, and that is in our March. So you want to count forward six months. That would probably be six or seven months, they figure, is when they actually started working on this. Mm -hmm. And they completed it and had it set up 11 and a half months into the year. It was just almost a year before the tabernacle set up. I, I was just thinking they're making all these fancy, thick, huge. I know just from knitting that it takes a long time just to make a, you know, and to think that they're... 
Well, they, <coughs> you got to remember there were two and a half million people at least, so there were a lot of lot of worker bees there that they could have have work on things. <coughs> yes, yes, and and it must have been exciting to them, you know. This is wow! Can you imagine to have a project like that and the Lord wanting you to, you know, why? You know, God could have come down; He could have just done it perfectly without us, but He wanted us to be involved, and He still wants us to be involved. Uh, it would take a while, it, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you have to remember that God inspired them, the Holy Spirit inspired these people with knowledge and with the, the aptitude to, to do these things, you know. Well, I'm thinking <coughs> they go out in the fields and kill all these sheep. Then it takes a while to tan the hides to, you know, wool. Yeah, the wool. Did they, all the flax that they got from the women, They probably brought, uh, it, it says fine, fine linen, and, and it seems to indicate that was Egyptian, because Egypt, Egypt was known for the best linen in, in the world. And so they brought a lot of materials with them. Uh, you know, the Egyptians were just so glad to get rid of them, you know, and get rid of the plagues. They hopefully, you know, just get rid of these people, why maybe things will be better, you know. And so uh, they took lots of stuff with them. And that was their payment for all those years that they were slaves. You know, it wasn't like they were just given free stuff. They, they were really getting their back pay. And um, so they came with a lot of stuff. It's just like those mirrors, you know. They wouldn't have had any brass with them if they hadn't had the mirrors. God knew exactly what they were going to need for the tabernacle, and he had the Egyptians supply everything they needed uh, when they got there. So, yeah. Uh, there was still a lot of labor involved in a, a lot of these things, but they... It's easy when you're <coughs> to leave a place, or you're wanting to leave a place, you don't grab a mirror. Yeah. Flowers, yeah. Mirror. Right, that's right. Yeah. Purpose. And, and they, they had fabrics, and, and they had threads. I mean, beautiful... Uh, where else would they have gotten all of these things, you know, if they hadn't brought them from Egypt? This so. tabernacle must have been gorgeous. Yeah, amazing. But, you know, it wasn't beautiful on the outside. No, it was it the beauty was inside, that's right. and so that's a, just a picture. Yes. You know, our temple may not be beautiful, but inside is what's what's really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's all God, and God is beauty, and God is good, and and we can't even imagine His the glory that we you know when we actually get to heaven. That was like that video that Yeah, it was like oh. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't attractive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's. It's really an amazing thing, you know. We have a picture in our mind, but when we actually see, you know, what it was like. So, uh, we it's look at <coughs> the, the gold and stuff on the inside. We're, you know, that's where we're, I'm we're drawn to that, yeah, yes. <coughs> it's like the priest, you know, he was going to stand out because he was to be set apart from everybody else because he was going to be... Uh, between the people and God, you know, representing them and bringing their uh, sin offerings and all, you know. And here he was, he was glitzy, you know, with all of that, you know. And, but yet, it, it would have easily given him a big head. And I'm sure that there were plenty of priests, especially down, you know, at the time Jesus walked the earth. There were pre really horrible priests, uh, high priests. But God didn't want that big head for the high priest. He didn't. He wanted humility. He didn't want pride because he hates pride over everything. And so, what did the crown say? Holiness to the Lord. That was the reminder to that high priest that this isn't about you. This is about the Lord. 
be a little bit humble. You come humbly to the Lord. And so... Um, Even the, the <coughs> It's true. Yeah, only the only the rich, the royals could afford those uh, rich blue colors and then the purples. Yeah. Um. And the and the <coughs> places that they got them were very restricted. They were just out there for the whole world. And it's interesting that uh, they thought all of those things were lost over the years until just a few years ago they actually found the mussels that. You know, they get the blue and uh, different things. So God is getting things ready for that next temple because uh, there was no need for it before. He was preserving all of that so they wouldn't be destroyed until the time was needed for them again. And so all things are working the way God wants it to. The other thing that has been frustrating <coughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's a very good point. Yeah. person couldn't have done it all. It took the women with their mirrors. It took, you know, the people that could make the, the linens. Or Unity. Yeah. yeah. Unity, bringing us all together, working for a common purpose. And working. I think that's what it is <coughs> as a group. Absolutely. Believers, you know, we come together to study the word. We get different ideas from different people yeah. or different views. Absolutely, and and in the church, you know, it takes different people to do different things. Without Glenn, right. it'd be impossible to do the things that we do at church, you know. And of course, pastor, you know, is he's the head of the everything. And, the, and but even the people that clean, you know, uh, how would we manage without somebody to do that? That's very important. So everybody's got a job. Everybody has a purpose. Um, you know, I, I used to hear, well, it's it's like a body, you know. The the head's important, but no no more important than the feet are, you know. You're not going anywhere without the feet. The hands are important. So every every person has value and has a has a purpose. And sometimes we don't know what our purpose is, but you know, that's where the wisdom of God comes in. When you ask for wisdom, he'll show you what you can do. So um yeah, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, when uh, people are in unity that way. Don't fuss with each other. Don't complain. Don't criticize. Just try to bless each other, you know, because we are all human. We all make mistakes, and we all can get on nerves of somebody's nerves at times, you know, and uh, we just have to have to roll that way and just kind of overlook those things because um, it's just uh, what God wants. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Well, it would just be a matter of like perfume. Yes, some was real pungent, <coughs> and some was really sweet smelling. So it's whatever they put in it. Yeah, yeah, and of course. There's no place in the Bible that tells you how to make incense, right? We yeah, we covered that here uh, yeah, the so of God's incense, you know, that He wanted to to be used specifically, and and He ordered nobody else to make it. That was His, because if anybody else made it, it wouldn't be special to Him then. So um, it was very serious that you don't try to do that. I, I heard Chuck Smith once say, uh, oh, I was reading that, and I thought, that may, might be fun to try to mix up. And he said, and then I read a little further, and then I thought, maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a, he was a funny guy, but he was a good teacher. Um, so uh, let me see my notes here and see what we... Um, uh, Okay, let's just go ahead and finish uh, chapter 40, and then we'll talk a little bit more about everything. Finish this all up. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of congregation. So finally it's going to be set up. They've got everything all ready, and now the Lord has told them first uh, day of the first month. Now this is... This is called um, Rosh Kodesh. Rosh means head. As you, when they talk about the new year in uh, Israel, it's Rosh Hashanah. 
That's head of the year. Your Shoshana, Shana is year. And so Rosh Kodesh is head of the month. Kodesh is month. So that means the very first day. Okay. So uh, God is saying um, first day of the first month. And if you look on your um, calendar, uh, on the chrono chronological thing here, let me see if I can find it. Um, it would be the first day, first month, second year, the erection of the tabernacle. It would be about the fifth, fourth one down on the list. That would be the beginning of the second year. So it's been a year when they actually set it up. So that's how we know, and that would be the month of Abib. <coughs> And uh, I'll continue. Thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony and cover the ark with a veil. So um, now we're seeing listed. And uh, we can kind of go through. Remember that chart that I made comparing John, the Gospel of John, with uh, Exodus 40? As we go through, and, and it's listed in Exodus, each one of these is listed in order as they put them in the temple. And then here it's listed where the I am's that, that uh, Jesus uh, mentioned in the Gospel of John and they're all in orders. The sixth chapter, eighth chapter, 10th chapter, going down to the 15th chapter. <coughs> so it all ties in together. Uh, Old and New Testament, this is a completion. This was the shadow. <laughs> Okay, um, where did I leave here? Um, I think I stopped. Verse four. Verse four. Oh, thank you. I, did I read four? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and thou shalt bring in the table and set in order the things that are to be set in order. Uh, and thou shalt bring in the candlestick and light the lamps. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of testimony. And you remember what the incense is, uh, was for? Who remembers? Why? Prayer, the That's right. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> very good. It carried all of our prayers, or all of their prayers uh, up. Okay. I always thought incense, <coughs> I know this is stupid, but I always uh, thought of it as something from the Orient. Well, Well, you know, <laughs> Satan corrupts everything. He's, he, he never thinks about anything new himself, you know, never, he's not creative, but he's just a copycat. And, you know, it's like um, astrology is a copycat of the, really the order that God put in the heavens. There's actually, it tells the gospel in the heavens when you go back far enough. But see, everything's been distorted. Uh, numerology is another thing. God uses numbers in the Bible, but n there's a numerology that is really satanic. So you got to be careful of numbers. You know that way you don't want to get you don't want to get involved in some of that stuff, tarot cards and that type of thing. You know you just want to you want to really um, be discerning about things. Pray about don't you know you don't want to get sucked into New Age and that type of thing. You know, but uh, when you go back, God is the originator of everything, and everything is good. It's Another example is a rainbow. You know, that was God's sign of peace that he wasn't ever going to destroy the world. But, you know, that's been corrupted now uh, in our world today. And it's still, but it's still God's. The rainbow is still God's. And it's still appearing. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And so whatever, whenever we see these distortions used by Satan, by uh, paganism, you know, um, just remember that there's a, a seed in there that they took and corrupted, you know, that there's truth. Uh, usually there's some truth there that uh, we can find out what God really meant by things like that. So good to be discerning about things. Um, and you uh, shall set the altar of gold for the incense before the Ark of the Testimony and put the hangings of the door to the tabernacle. And you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And you shall set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and shall put water therein. 
and you shall set up the court uh, round about and hang up the hangings to the court gate. And you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein and thou shall anoint it and all the vessels uh, thereof and it shall be holy. And you shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all of his vessels and sanctify the altar and it shall be an altar most holy. And you shall anoint the laborer and his foot and sanctify it. And you shall bring Aaron and his sons into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And you shall put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with coats and you shall anoint them as they did anoint, anoint their father and they may administer unto me in the priest's office for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. In other words, it's gonna be passed down from father to son. Uh, they will be the priests. Nobody else can claim to be a priest. It's gotta come from that. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first of the day of the month that the tabernacle was reared up. So here we have the first month and the second year. So it's been one complete year since uh, all of this started. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set the boards thereof and put the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. I can just see all the people watching and, and just excited about this. It must have been a wonderful thing. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above uh, upon it and the Lord as the Lord had commanded and he took and put the testimony of the ark and set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above from the ark and he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and he covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses and he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without a veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar of the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle and he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. And when they went into the tent of the congregation, when they came near to the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Okay, we're gonna stop right there. So everything is all complete there. Um, let me go over my notes here and see if I don't miss anything. Um, okay, uh, one important thing is that you notice the tabernacle. Let me get my tabernacle chart here. <coughs> And you notice it was to be set up so that the only entrance was from the, was on the east. They would have to go in with their back to the sun. Now, I have heard commentaries say, well, that was probably because um, all the pagans worshiped the sun god. And so it was like an in your face type of thing with God, you know, and we're not gonna face the sun. However, I think there's probably a better reasoning for it when I dug a little deeper. And so, um, let me look here. Um, if we go clear back to creation, to the beginning, Adam and Eve left Eden which way did they head? They headed east, didn't they? And it seems like the further east the people would go, the presence of God, 
seemed to be leaving him behind. They just started getting really evil, you know, the further they go. Uh, Babylon, uh, the Tower of Babel, was um, built in the east. And uh, Sodom and Gora, Gomorrah, that says they were on the east side. So when we look towards the east, uh, it's further away they get from God, you know, the further they go east, it seems like. So that's, that's a key right there. Um, when, and then I was thinking about Abram. How did, he, how did God bring Abram? He was already in the east. He brought him back west, didn't he? West and then down. So he was bringing him back to him. Abram didn't know where he was going. He was just following the Lord, but, he, but the Lord was leading him back that way. Um, and so here we, again, we have the word teshuva, which means to turn back toward God. And that's what Abram did. And that's what God wants of us. So when people are going in the east side, they're turning their back on the evil, on the ways that aren't God, and they're turning towards God, entering. They're always entering towards God, and they're entering that way. So when you understand that, it makes a lot more sense that uh, he would do that. Um, Let's uh, finish up here with, um, let's see, verse 34 and, uh, through 38. <coughs> now, all, everything was all finished. The, uh, the priests had been anointed, and um, it was all go now. And so at that time, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This was God in effect saying that he was pleased with everything. It was the way he wanted it, and he was there to live amongst them and to be their God, to reassure them. And it says that Moses wasn't able to enter the tent of the congregation. Now, Moses had been with him, you know, on the mountain several times, at least twice, some people think maybe three times. Um, and, um, and yet he wasn't able to go in. The glory was so heavy and of course, that's what glory means. It means a heaviness. It's God's presence is just so, there's so much power there, you know. We, we can't even understand what it means. Um, kavod. <laughs> I had trouble a couple weeks ago remembering that kavod. But anyway, um, that, that's glory. And um, it, it filled the, the congregation, the tent. And... Um, he was not even able to go in. That was, I found that very interesting. And uh, then it says that um, when the cloud was taken up, the children of Israel went forward in all their journeys. But if the cloud wasn't taken up, they journeyed not until the day it was taken up. So uh, in my mind, God is their GPS. <laughs> he's leading them, but he's also watching over them and guiding them, just like a good shepherd and reassuring him that he was always with them because that cloud was there in the morning to reassure him. And at night, it was a pillar of fire and it was like a light that they could see wh what they were doing, you know, it's kind of like a night light. <laughs> and uh, to reassure him and to take care of him. And, and I'm sure anybody that was looking at him around, you know, there were people that lived, you know, pagans that lived all around. They could see all this and, um, yeah, it must have been really an interesting, interesting thing. You know, so, um, for 40 years, why God was with them in this manner. Nowadays, God is with us, but he's living in us and guiding us. So, it's, uh, I think we have it the best. <laughs> we, we, have, we have it the best. But they, they were certainly uh, reassured that God was always with them, but yet they still murmured and all, you know. Um, we're going to, in the next few weeks, uh, we're going to look at the last three books of Moses. And we're not going to read the whole thing because, um, well, Leviticus actually talks about the laws. We're just kind of hit and miss on that. We're going to hit, hit the high points of Leviticus because a lot of the laws don't actually pertain to us particularly. Some of them actually do. Some of them are the, you know, things that we need to know and, and uh, 
that are good for us, you know, to, to know. Um, so that would be Leviticus. And then uh, Numbers, uh, we're going to spend a little time in Numbers because there are a lot of incidents in there that they went through um, that we need to look at. Balaam uh, will be one we'll look at. That's, that's a good one. Uh, the, uh, the 12 spies, we'll, we'll look at their little adventure into the uh, promised land. And, and um, just a few other things, you know, that are important. So um, that'll be kind of fun to look through that. And then uh, Deuteronomy, the last book, we're going to compare Deuteronomy with uh, all of the quotes of Jesus because that Deuteronomy was quoted more than any other book uh, by Jesus. So it's important, I think, that we look at those things. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my plan. Now, after we get those uh, things uh, taken care of, I'm open to maybe some um, advice or, or some comments about what we want to study next. I want to see what you would like to do next for a book. Um, I think we'll just take a little break from uh, Israel for a little while. Uh, I do want to do Joshua eventually, but I think it's just, this is time maybe just take a break and do something different. And um, maybe at the first of the year or, or maybe sometime. Some of the women. That's a thought too. I am women in the Bible. There are a lot of interesting women, a lot of um, beautiful women in there, and a lot of really bad women. And I think it's good to take a look at both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be a, a really fun thing, I think. You know, Old and New Testament <laughs> women. Um, the Minor Prophets, a lot of people don't know much about them. And uh, they're little short books that would be pretty easy to go through. Um, everybody knows Jonah, you know, and that's a fun one to, to read. But a lot of the other ones are pretty important, too. So um, that's another option. And... Um, of course, there's the New Testament, something in the New Testament, you know, that might be interesting for, to look at uh, these days. So a lot of options. And um, just let me know what you want to do, and we'll take a consensus and, and do it. So anybody have any comments or questions on... Uh, I do. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay, so it said that Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle. When did they enter the tabernacle? When the cloud was taken away, they were able to go in? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know why he wasn't able to go in. It doesn't really answer that. Well, it just said that the glory, glory was... was so yeah, it was, yeah, it said, yeah. Well, then when were the people able to go in? Well, of course, the priests were the ones that really went in. Mm. Uh, they were the only ones, really, that went in uh, the actual tabernacle. The other people would bring their... Um, sacrifices in to, to the altar. Okay. And then the priest would take them. The, if you wanted to pay for your sins for that year or whatever, uh, you would bring in your goat or whatever you had. You know, you put, the man would put his hands on the head of the goat and then the priest would take it. And then they would... Uh, they did all the slaughtering inside the tent. They no, they did it. The, the yeah, they... You enter in like it, this. This is the burnt offering right here. As soon as you go in, there's the burnt offering. That's that's where all the, the sacrificing is done. So yeah. This, but they didn't, um, they didn't actually go into the tabernacle to worship. No, no. They went in for the forgiveness the, of their sins. The only ones that went in were the priests in yeah. here. Okay. And the high priest is the only one that would go in here once a year. Once a year. Well, we haven't prayed or anything. Sorry. <laughs> so. Okay, we'll, we'll finish up right now. And I just uh, thank everybody that um, might be out there watching. Hope that you've enjoyed Exodus. Um, we're just going to pray now. And uh, thank you, Father, for all that you've shown us uh, throughout this book. It's been a wonderful trip through, and uh, we are so um, thankful for your word, so thankful for uh, giving us your knowledge, Lord, a little bit of your knowledge and your wisdom. And we just uh, ask you to bless everyone today in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right.